my dear colleagues, friends, guests, most especially I'd like to welcome the members of the Diplomatic Corps that are here today, headed by His Excellency the Papal Nuncio, Most Reverend Charles John Brown, and all the other ambassadors, uh, our dear colleagues, and of course, uh, our former colleagues of the Senate, to my family and friends, magandang magandang umaga po sa inyo lahat. To my colleagues, thank you for the trust. I shall repay that honor with hard work as your trabajador ng Senado. To my family, my wife, Audrey, who's always been supportive of me 1,000%. To my children, Adriana, Juan, me, and Santi. To my mother and father, Mommy Vicky and Daddy Joe, I pledge that nothing I do will stain the memory of our ancestors or sour your love for me. It is with humility that I accept this position. I do so conscious of the burden it carries and committed to the work it entails. As presiding officer, I may wield the gavel, but not the power of this institution. That power is shared by us all, by every one of you, and more so our main responsibility of responding to the needs of the people and respecting their will. I say this, my friends, because you and I know that never has the fate of the Senate been dependent on the hands of only one man. It has always rested on the collective shoulders of all its members. The Senate has been described as one of the main engines of the ship of state, all of its 24 cylinders firing, unleashing the energy that propels our nation forward. However, this Senate does not merely row, it also steers the ship so it will not run into shoals or storms. It is the reason why we have to keep watch, always. But every new Senate's course is chartered by the challenges under which it operates. Every new Senate job description is written by the crisis it must confront. And ours is dictated by multiple crises before us. Food, fuel, fiscal, and the fading faith of our people in our institutions just to name a few. On top of this is the COVID pandemic, which courtesy of a mutating virus will continue to disrupt lives and choke the economy before it can breathe its very last. But what it cannot suffocate is the fighting spirit of a people whose virtues of hard work, solidarity, compassion are greater than the virus at its vilest. This Senate will meet these big problems with bold thinking and brave legislation, but most especially, and I'm looking forward to this, bipartisanship. In this Senate workshop of great ideas, laws will be forged and from which oversight of those who implement or ignore the laws will also be conducted. And speaking of oversight, we will exercise it not because we want to encroach on the executive branch or emasculate it of its powers. We do so in order to help government, the presidency even, remedy deficiencies in the delivery of public services and recalibrate ineffective policies. This Senate, under my leadership, however, will be one to solve problems more than it would find faults. While probes are magnets for publicity, and I learned this from the father of Sonia Angara, Senator Ed Angara, it is the policies, laws patiently written line by line away from the limelight that drives progress. But for us to do our role, we must uphold the Senate's proud tradition of being independent. And that is important because the Senate's independence is a linchpin of its two other hallmarks, industry and innovation. Generations of our predecessors whose names are etched on the wall leading to this hall have exercised this to the benefit of our people. The Senate, therefore, is not an office of 24 receiving clerks for executive proposals. We will improve what has been proposed to us as we initiate our own. We do so not because we are rivals of power or for power, 
for the other branch, but because we are partners for progress. We do so not to compete for influence, but to cooperate for the ways and means on how to bring the nation forward. This stance practiced by all the Senates which had sat before us has been the proven formula on how this chamber has been able to uphold the interests of the Republic and promote the welfare of our people. Our vigilance has purged proposed laws or provisions that harm the people. Our insight, on the other hand, have maximized the gains of our people will reap from laws. When bills are unnecessarily complicated, we inject it with common sense. When bills attempt to overreach, we shield the vulnerable. And when proposed tax rates are higher than what is reasonable, we make them fair or we make them go away. When the suggested spending borders on the frivolous, we remind them to be frugal. And when problems remain unattended, we come up with solutions. Not even the COVID-19 pandemic prevented the Senate before us from making emergency bills like Bayanian 1 and Bayanian 2 evolve into superior pieces of legislation despite having to conduct business remotely because every man and woman in this chamber rose to that occasion. Today, my dear colleagues, we will troop to the Batasan to hear President Ferdinand Bongbong Marcus Jr. perform his constitutional duty of telling us the state of the nation. For sure, he will be asking Congress to support initiatives that will address the people's clamor for jobs, bring down prices of basic goods, affordable food, humane transport, among other relief measures. And when he enumerates them, my dear friends, let us view them in the proper context, that this is not a presidential wish list, wish list rather, he crafted on his own, but a president articulating what the people want. So let us respond to what the people want urgently. And let us do it through the time-honored fashion by which the Senate has acted upon during times of crisis, by harnessing the best ideas from our brightest can offer. So the cures will not just bring temporary relief, but also permanently release our people from what ails them. Acting on this urgent request, I will also allow us to redeem the campaign promises we, and pledges that we have made. This will be the first down payment of what we owe the people for the mandate they have gifted us with. So let us come up with bills that deliver a big payload of solutions to the big problems of the land, what the people truly want that will improve their lives and not just foggy points for the Senate. Laws that will bring social good, not just social media hits. Jobs created, hunger reduced, inflation slashed, GNP growth, houses built, higher school test scores, and middle class expanded are the metrics that should gauge our performance instead of likes, shares, and views. Legislation must not lag behind the social, economic, and technological curve, my dear colleagues. It also must be ahead of what the people want. This requires scrutinizing the budget so that the tax payments will be spent on things that will go or do greater good rather than to those or to do greater good to those who pay them. If there is one mission that should animate the Senate of the 19th Congress, it is an overriding theme. Then it must be a Senate of national reconstruction. But the recovery that we should work for together is not merely returning to where we were once before. It is catapulting ourselves to a better place than the past. And as we buckle down to work, let me issue some invitations. To the public, let me assure you that this is not only a multitasking Senate, it is also a crowdsourcing one. We value your ideas because this upper chamber will never be an echo chamber. To my fellow Senate workers, to the men and women of the Secretariat, in these trying times when so many expect so much from so few of us, the people expect no less than your hard work and professionalism. To my dear, dear colleagues in the majority, 
I remain with you in the trenches. I see no perks in this position. I temporarily hold this position through your grace, except the duty to work even harder. To my friends in the minority, I was once a loyal soldier of the opposition. And if there's one lesson I've carried with me ever since, it is that the strength of an idea is what makes it right and not the sheer number of its believers. Let us debate and embrace ideas without regard from where they came from. My dear colleagues, my leadership will be one of consultation. Our output will be through consensus building. And if former Senate President Tito Sen was a father figure to all of us, then allow me to be your brother that will walk with you during these challenging times. Yes, my dear friends, no Senate in the past faced challenges as demanding and daunting as this one before us. But with hard work and dedication, we will deliver for the people. We shall help them overcome. The war against the pandemic is not yet over. The battle in many fronts is about to get worse. There is a future to be won. Let us go to our battle stations and fight to uplift our people's lives and make our nation even greater than before. Mabuhay ang Senado at mabuhay ang Pilipinas. Maraming salamat po.